you very much uh, for attending the last day of the Piazza slash World uh, Congress of Polish Studies. So uh, we're very uh, pleased to have everyone here and uh, very pleased to have our, uh, our panel uh, with us. So when Jim Pola told me this was a uh, conference that was going to look at anniversaries, I said, Jim, we got a great anniversary for you, the 70th uh, anniversary of NATO, 20th anniversary of our Polish allies in NATO, 15th anniversary of our Lithuanian allies in NATO. So I was very happy when, uh, when Jim invited me to do that. I was very happy that we could give representatives from the, uh, the Polish Ministry of Defense, the Lithuanian Ministry of Defense, and my uh, old friend and colleague, Ray Wojcik, who uh, currently works for the Center for European Policy Analysis. So just to do a little uh, shameless plug for how I really get involved in this is uh, Dean Anthony Bidek, who spoke uh, yesterday. Uh, he is the founder and the president, and I'm one of the executive vice presidents, that every year at the Military Academy, we do a ceremony. The Academy does a ceremony to honor Thaddeus Kosciuszko, and we do a conference. And so we have made this better year by year, and we have expanded it. A lot of times it's just about Kosciuszko, but we've made it about the life and the legacy of Kosciuszko. And by doing that, we think we uh, expand the scope and the time frame, and also we're able to bring it a little more modern, particularly here the last few years, we've gotten great support from our Lithuanian and Polish allies to support this. And now we think we're becoming a venue where we can have them come together uh, to discuss substantive issues. Come on in, gentlemen. So with that, that's how we get involved with this, and uh, we think it's, it really helps us. Tony and I like to, uh, to come to this event because we can find future speakers for our conference, uh, hopefully future members for our association. So uh, four years ago, Jim Pula, uh, actually at one of our, our conferences at West Point, said, uh, Steve, I know you're not a Piazza member, but I think you would like, to, uh, like the venue and we'd like you to participate because we don't really do any current security or defense issues. So the year that Jim asked me to do it, the conference was in Washington, D.C. And it worked out, we've had some really great topical topics. So that year in 2016, it was uh, in June, right before the NATO Warsaw Summit. And I think a lot of the things we talk about today can uh, focus back to what happened in Warsaw and what's coming uh, in, into policy and into reality today. Uh, the next year, Jim, and actually that first year, Jim made me the plenary session. So I had, uh, matter of fact, we had the same, the same cast of characters there. I had a Lithuanian attaché, Polish attaché, and uh, we had a, from, uh, uh, from uh, we had a SIPA member also for that. So it was, uh, it was a good event. The next year we were in Krakow, and that worked out very well because Poland had just gone through their big defense security review, and we were able to look specifically at what Poland was doing, and we were one year past Warsaw to see what NATO and other Central and Eastern European uh, allies were doing. Last year it worked out very well in uh, Columbia University in New York City, so when Jim asked me again to do it, I said this is great because Poland is coming, uh, they're in their, their rotational uh, temporary term on the UN Security Council, so we had a panel uh, on that. So that's kind of the background of what, uh, what I've been doing for that. What I want to do now is just very quickly touch on a few NATO issues to kind of tee it up uh, for my colleagues here. <clears throat> so initially when NATO uh, comes into force after the end of World War II, only 12 member states. And you can see that there was a long period of time between 52 and uh, 82 where we had four additional members. And then after the end of the Cold War, when the Warsaw Pact goes away, NATO membership expands. So particularly in 99, Poland comes in with uh, two other allies, so we're marking their 20th anniversary. Five years later in 2004, uh, Lithuania comes in with uh, six other allies, we're, we're uh, marking their 15th year. And then it, uh, we've also had some newer members join and membership remains open. And that can be a contentious uh, topic, but there is a process for that and uh, countries, as long as they meet the requirements, can apply for NATO membership. So currently today, 29 members. Two things just to mention very briefly, and these are things you hear in the news sometimes that I think uh, people don't always understand. So Washington Treaty establishes North Atlantic Treaty Organization. The one thing you always hear people talk about are, is Article 5, usually com uh, commonly shorthanded the collective defense uh, article. And so that basically says an attack on one member is an attack on all members. 
Uh, as some of my friends at NATO like to say, that is the blood oath. If you become a member, then all members are in this uh, together. Article 3, a little bit lesser known, but I like pointing that out because I think individual countries have a responsibility to the alliance, and I think our Polish and Lithuanian allies are good allies. They take it uh, uh, very seriously to prepare for their own defense, to work with other member nations, particularly here in the region, uh, so they can add to the collective defense. Probably the best way I've heard that explained is uh, Article 5 is the right that you have. If you become a NATO member, you will be defended. Article 3 lays out the responsibility. As a NATO member, you must do these things uh, to then be able to uh, ensure that we have a good, strong Article 5. So what we're going to look at now, NATO at 70. <clears throat> uh, again, I'm very, very fortunate. Uh, just two months ago, we had a, a conference at West Point, and we did a NATO, NATO topic there. We had Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, who was a recently retired U.S. Army Europe commander, and he was our keynote speaker. Then we also had the uh, Polish military attaché and the Lithuanian military attaché speak at the conference. Uh, then also we were joined by, who took part in the, the uh, ceremony the next day, the Vice Minister of Defense from Lithuania. So when I went out to our, our colleagues and said, hey, we're doing this event at, at uh, Piazza, we'd like to have some representation, I was very uh, surprised and honored that we have very senior representation with us today. So from the Polish Minister of Defense, uh, Rafał Sokowski, he is, he is uh, Poland's um, senior uh, NATO policy representative. From uh, the Lithuania Ministry of Defense, Robertus Sopronis. Uh, Robertus is the policy director in Lithuania's Ministry of Defense. So very pleased to have these two gentlemen. And then Ray Wojcik, who's a retired Army colonel, my old friend from our time in the Pentagon. Uh, most recently, he was our Army attaché at, at our embassy in Warsaw. And now he runs the SIPA, Center for European Policy Analysis. He runs their office in Warsaw. Okay, so given that, I'll now ask Raffle to, uh, to begin. Yes, good morning, everyone. So I'm uh, Rafał Sulkowski, a senior expert at the International Security Policy Department in the Polish Ministry of National Defense. This department deals with uh, security policy cooperation, international one, but in uh, multilateral settings, such as NATO, UN, EU, and other organizations. So thank you for inviting me to the conference. Um, I think it's a good opportunity because it's, uh, it's, uh, it can be considered as a part of dialogue between government institutions and society. Uh, and this is the exchange that is mutually beneficial because uh, it, it's always interesting for us representatives of ministries to have a uh, perspective of uh, the, the society which can make us civil servants more aware of certain aspects and on the contrary uh, it allows us also to communicate uh, to the wider public about what we are doing. Um, so uh, I'm also very glad that this discussion takes place in Gdańsk because mm -hmm. in fact it's a highly symbolic place to talk about defense given that the Second World War started here and uh, in fact today I, our main role as security experts is to minimize the risk of an aggression that could entail any new war. So I will uh, begin with uh, discussing uh, the security environment of Poland. 1989 marked for Poland the beginning of the process of regaining full sovereignty in international relations. But still in 1989 the, uh, the Eastern Bloc was still there in fact at the uh, Warsaw Pact which was the organization dominated by the Soviet Union was still not dissolved in 1989 the Iron Curtain, which is marked with the thick black line, was still present there. So the one of the main goals of Polish foreign policy at the time was to change this status quo. And nowadays we are in a totally different uh, situation. Our security environment is, uh, is shaped both by NATO and the EU, 
On the map you can see the countries that are members both all of NATO and EU, uh, the violet color, dark blue, uh, these are members of only EU and uh, uh, orange is only NATO. And the main tendency, tendency which influences today the security situation are changes in international order. Because the status quo based on international law has been ser seriously challenged as, as a result of some countries willing to play more important role uh, in the regional or global orders and they are, they are trying in fact to establish a kind of new security governance to limit what they consider the dominance of the United States in international relation, I re relations and by this they uh, aim to um, create an order that would be based on uh, zones of influence and uh, multipolarity and states can also use uh, non-state actors as uh, well to attain their goals in foreign policy and uh, and many of them take this opportunity this is also quite a new phenomenon um, and very important factor influencing our security environment today are also conflicts in our neighborhood so I, I would like to mention especially the conflict between uh, Russia and Ukraine with the illegal occupation of uh, Crimea which which is in fact uh, blatantly uh, against uh, international law in, in, in fact we can consider it's the first time since the end of the Second World War that in Europe the um, uh, the borders of a sovereign state uh, was uh, were forcibly changed but of course this uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict is not the only problem in the relations between Russia and the West uh, Moscow has also extended its pressure in several other aspects including arms control, efforts to influence Western political debate, also intelligence operations on the territory of NATO members uh, involving also the use of chemical weapons as we saw in the case of Skripal attack mm. in, in the UK, also conflict in Syria and we are also uh, qu uh, quite concerned with the militarization ongoing in Russia uh, in fact um, uh, it involves the build up of military infrastructure including uh, placing close to Poland's borders um, systems mis mis missile systems capable of carrying tactical nuclear weapons and it's really very close from here Gdańsk it's around 60 kilometers you have the Kaliningrad district where these uh, rather infamous Iskander missiles are deployed in parallel we can also observe of course still the deterioration of the situation in uh, the Middle East and in North Africa which is bringing another um, security issues especially terrorism which can be consider considered as a truly pervasive threat because it, it can appear everywhere and uh, gives the impression of being uncontrollable and it's not only about terrorism that we can in fact we can also qualify, uh, qualify other threats related to uh, some aspects of economic or criminal activity that maybe are not directly uh, considered as security threats but that, they, that can have serious sec security implications and these crouching threats we may say culminate in what is named hybrid warfare which combines uh, different instruments uh, military and non-military uh, non-military with a hostile intention but below the threshold of a recognized war and this allows <coughs> to create ambiguity in Terralia to avoid uh, responsibility of state actors for their uh, unlawful uh, behavior one of the main elements of hybrid warfare is also disinformation much has been said about it I would like just underline one aspect of it that it can have uh, serious political or diplomatic consequences as it was the case in the relations between Poland and Israel recently uh, the way to counter hybrid warfare is in general to increase the resilience of the society and by resilience I understand the ability to withstand adverse situations in fact our contemporary societies have uh, 
certain vulnerabilities which are especially, especially linked to the fact that we are used to the high level of well-being, of comfort, and uh, this can be exploited uh, by hybrid warfare. But, and this is very important, all these pervasive threats do not crowd out uh, traditional challenges which are related to the defense of territory and of uh, state sovereignty. In terms of national response of Poland to these threats, well, we especially develop armed forces, both quantitatively and qualitatively. There is a, a quite a large campaign of recruitment ongoing to all kinds of military service. Of course, the most spectacular increase <coughs> is in the territorial defense force, uh, out of projected 53,000 uh, created from scratch. In fact, we have already uh, 20,000 troops, all of them are voluntary. It's also proof of social support for the armed forces, uh, which is crucial in terms of the overall resilience of the country. Uh, we are uh, building a new division. Well, you know that armed forces are organized into so-called tactical units, battalions, brigades. The next level is division. So we have uh, three divisions in Poland. Now we are building the fourth. And very important, it's, uh, it's going to be located east of, east of Vistula to secure that region. In terms of quality, uh, of course, there is the, the process of modernization of armed forces. The, the best known examples are the Patriot, uh, contracts by Patriots, in fact, the largest contract in our history. And also, we, are, we started the process related to the acquisition of F-35 aircrafts. <coughs> uh, one of the main threats is related also uh, to cyber domain um, and uh, in this uh, domain in fact the effects of an attack can be the same as uh, in a case of of a conventional attack using weapons. The, the impact on the infrastructure can be the same. So that is why Poland undertakes measures to be prepared to these threats. In the Ministry of National Defense we um, we introduced the program called uh, Cyber do, the, or the project called the Cyber.mil.pl. The main element of this is to establish cyber defense forces. And Minister of National Defen Defense has appointed a, a plenipotentiary uh, for uh, the creation of these forces. He's also the director of National Center of Security of Cyberspace that has already been established. And there is also going to be a cyber component uh, within Territorial Defense Forces. Uh, it's the similar solution to the one in the U.S. National Guard, in fact. Uh, also, energy has a strong uh, security dimension. Uh, also can be related to attacks on infrastructure, but also it's, uh, this sector can be used as an instrument of pressure and sowing division between uh, countries and the best example of it if was, is of course the case of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Mm, right uh, what is characteristic in Poland about the efforts in the energy sector is that the, the security aspects related to this are uh, in fact managed especially by the institutions that are not directly part of the security sector such as especially the state-owned uh, company PGN NIG uh, in the oil and gas sector. And now I would like to uh, show you some of strategic documents because of course our policies are informed uh, by strategic documents. Uh, the most important is uh, this of stra a strategy for responsible literally or sustainable development <coughs> which contains a whole of government approach. Also other documents. The uh, Ministry of National Defense was responsible of the strategic defense review that you mentioned and the outcome of it is the defense concept of 2016. According to it, we envisage the increase in the readiness of Polish armed forces. Also, uh, they should uh, better cooperate with governmental agencies in case of crisis management operation. And this is due, of course, uh, to hybrid, to the threat of irregular hybrid warfare. <coughs> In terms of international security cooperation, strategically, three di dimensions are especially important for Poland. Uh, alliances, because in fact only superpowers can 
uh, take care of their security on their own. Second dimension is related to the stabiliz stabilization of our neighborhood. And third dimension to the regional cooperation in the security domain. Examples are Visegrad Group and also B9, Bucharest 9, involving uh, Visegrad uh, countries plus Romania, Bulgaria, and also uh, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. Also, uh, very interesting <coughs> three C's initiative merging uh, economic aspects and also uh, security ones, or those which are supporting security. So now I will <coughs> talk about our perspective on NATO. As I mentioned at the beginning, one of the main goals of Polish foreign policy after 1989 was to modify the security environment profoundly influenced by the Cold War. So th that is why early in the process of democratic transition we opted for membership in NATO. It was for us a way to confirm our autonomous status in international relations and entrenching our security. Because thanks to Article 5 that you mentioned, NATO guarantees such entrenchment. And the <coughs> membership in NATO also meant for Poland an impulse for modernization of the armed forces, uh, especially to assure interoperability of these forces with uh, those of other allies. NATO provides also a very effective framework to address threats and challenges in our security environment. And one of these major challenges is a uh, risk of short notice or no notice conflicts in our neighborhood. And the response to this that is given by NATO is enhanced forward presence that was decided at the Warsaw Summit in 2016. So we have four multinational uh, battle groups each, uh, in four countries, each one with a framework nation and a participation, participating nation. In fact, of course, in Poland, the framework nation is the US. And they are placed nor in northeast of the country. We see enhanced forward presence and as, as an important oh. achievement Sorry, for it. This one. <laughs> given, in fact, that it's the first time uh, that NATO forces are present in Central Europe. <coughs> and in enhanced forward presence is also coupled with appropriate com command structure headquarters at the core level in Szczecin and at the division level at, uh, in Elbląg, both, both of which we have the privilege to host uh, as Poland. And uh, also I mentioned um, as a challenge the to maintain our readiness. So NATO is undertaking multiple initiatives, initiatives intended to strengthen its deterrence and defense posture, and they are concentrated a, a, along three lines, the so-called three R's. The first is uh, responsiveness, how much time it takes to react in case of emergency. Readiness, meaning forces that are ready to use, the availability of them, and the reinforcement, so basically the ability to move forces across Europe and also across the Atlantic. Another domain important for, for Poland in which NATO contributes is uh, civilian military interaction. But I would like especially focus on one of the uh, issues that is of common concern for Poland and for NATO, which is ballistic missile defense, because it's a domain uh, where it is particularly visible how Poland's and NATO actions are complementary. In fact, uh, f from Polish perspective, the threat, the ballistic threat, it's related mostly to short-range missiles. So the acquisition of Patriot is a part of uh, response. But in parallel, the, there is a threat related to medium and intermediate range missiles, so longer range, from the Middle East. And this threat co concerns all European NATO members. So Poland hosting a ballistic missile in installation in Redzikovo, not very far from here, contributes to the overall NATO effort in this uh, domain because this op uh, installation operates as part of NATO BMD system. <coughs> well, in general, the uh, the approach to uh, threats uh, is that we um, participate in NATO response also to threats that probably uh, don't concern us uh, directly. 
and uh, that's why, for example, Poland participated in many missions and operations of NATO. In fact, our first deployment within NATO took place even before we became NATO members. Uh, and uh, these deployments uh, take place, as, uh, well, ma the majority of them in the southern flank. In fact, um, there are also domains in which we are at the same time receiver and provider of NATO support. <coughs> so Poland is the host country of Enhanced Forward Presence Battle Group. But also, we participate uh, in the similar battle group in Latvia. I think we are, uh, in fact, we are the only country in enhanced for presence that both receives the support and, and contributes. And moreover, Polish troops are deployed to Romania in the framework of tailored forward presence. This shows that, well, as a country, in fact, we are committed to something what we expect from others namely an equal <coughs> level of security for all NATO members regardless of their geographic uh, uh, location. Because the general approach that we have within NATO is that, well you mentioned in fact that uh, this relation between Article 5 and 3 that is uh, rights, th these are rights and obligations, so uh, indeed w uh, in Poland we take it seriously and we do not only want to be like beneficiaries of security guarantees provided by NATO in Article 5, but we also provide security to other countries uh, willing to fulfill our obligation of an ally as a matter of solidarity. And you know that this word solidarity <laughs> means a lot in Poland <laughs> and it's especially good to mention it in Gdańsk where the Solidarity Movement uh, bo was born in the 1980s. So as a conclusion, I would like to underline one crucial aspect of Poland's membership in NATO, which shouldn't be regarded only in terms of a sort of cost-benefit analysis. As I mentioned uh, before, during, during Cold War, Poland experienced limited sovereignty that is why after that, that period we were keen to join organizations such as NATO that, and EU that guaranteed not only our security but also our independent status in international relations. And another very important factor was that these organizations refer to values, uh, the respect of which often lacked in Poland between before 1989, such as individual liberty, democracy or human rights. So the membership of NATO was for us not just a question of political pragmatism, but the question of belonging to an organization uh, whose objectives are in accordance with our identity. Thank you very much for my yeah, Thank you. Okay, Rob, well, we appreciate that very much. Uh, I'd like to now ask uh, Director Sopronis to come up. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I don't have slides. I was sure that Rafael will cover all the key points, and <laughs> I'll still sta sta stand here because I just read a study that uh, they say that uh, men's brains work 20% better when one is standing rather than sitting. <laughs> Let's, see. Let's see how it goes. But it's uh, indeed a real great pleasure to, to be here in, in, in Dansk. I'm really impressed by the scale of this conference. Uh, three days, uh, lots of panels, and thanks, Stephen, for organizing this uh, panel dedicated to. 70 anniversary of, of NATO. 70 years may sound like a lot, but I think it's uh, very appropriate to remember here that Lithuania Polish alliance has lasted for more than 300 years and with some major battles being fought not far away from here. And, um, and, and indeed, uh, uh, our history sort of developed in parallel, and I'm very glad that we are again part of, of the same alliance and, uh, again. Although, as uh, again Rafael I think mentioned, there were periods in our history which were less kind uh, and our countries were sort of uh, now referred, to, to borrow this phrase of Timothy Schneider, as bloodlands uh, mm -hmm. uh, during the 20th century and sometimes relations between the two countries were not at best, but I'm very, very glad of the state of affairs we have uh, at, at the moment. And I think this is important for regional security and for, uh, for uh, European security. 
And I think what's important to note here that due to this uh, painful history, our countries will be uh, will remain anxious more than European average, let, let me say, uh, about their security, about N NATO's health, NATO strength, and about U.S. presence, dare I say, in Europe and, and in the region. Therefore, it's again very appropriate to have this panel in this sort of tri trilateral setup, if, if I may say so, and, um, and indeed it's, uh, uh, we hope this alliance will uh, endure for, for the benefit of, of, um, uh, of our countries and, and Europe. But uh, to say a few words about sort of past, present and, and future of NATO, how we in Vilna see it, uh, I think uh, to start with sort of uh, very early days from, of our independence in, in 1990, we sort of uh, take this honor of breaking up of Soviet Union, as uh, Lufina was the first country to, to declare uh, its independence in 1990. So this NATO was sort of... Um, uh, uh, s s some sort of symbol of the West. I think the whole sort of revolution at the time was about return to our pro place in Europe, return to the West, uh, and EU and NATO were sort of symbols of that. So, so NATO was sort of something quite distant, uh, but uh, something very, really important for our future. Then, uh, uh, probably from '94, I would say it sort of developed into sort of dream. Uh, the PFP has started, we have joined PFP, regular travel to Brussels has started and uh, sort of we said, well, well, we look more or less like, like others uh, and uh, we can talk same things, we uh, sort of have same values and uh, this could so, so one day, perhaps in a distant future, the membership could, could become realistic. But then in 1997, very soon, Poland, Hungary and Czech Republic were invited to become NATO and I think that was a turning point for, for Lufina saying, well, this this can be, be serious and uh, this is uh, sort of very realistic to have as a sort of foreign and security policy objective. And, uh, and since then uh, things started with were very sort of special years, uh, lots of convincing, uh, you know, people would say, okay, well, Hungary, Poland, yeah, they are sort of uh, uh, Central and Eastern Europe like you are, but you know, still you were part of the Soviet Union, you are not so defendable and, and Russia may not be so happy, you know, with or more unhappy to see you as part of the alliance than, than uh, Polish or, or, or other Central European countries. But in the end, well, uh, it, it ended as, as we know in 2004 with accession of uh, seven new members, uh, including all three Baltic countries, uh, uh, Bulgaria, Romania, Slovenia, and Slovakia, the sort of big bang. Uh, well, this looked to sort of uh, a happy end, uh, but uh, in the end, uh, now with the benefit of uh, Knowing what happened next, I think we sort of made it uh, before the window has closed. Uh, I think uh, Russia was, uh, as events in Georgia have shown, you know, was was starting to 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 project its uh, sort of power in in its neighborhood, and uh, and this uh, sort of Georgia and of course later Ukraine has has shown what could has have happened. And I think uh, it's uh, it was sort of uh, we made it right right on time. And of course, after accession to NATO, our objective was: what's next? You know, we sort of we were knocking uh, on various doors for 15 years, and now we've got everywhere. Sort of, what's, what should be our objective as an ally? And I think we were trying to prove that we are not sort of special, not new allies, but normal allies, and that we are security providers. We're not just security consumers, as everybody would think. And as a result, we ended up with uh, punching much above our weight in places like Afghanistan, where we led a PRT, Provincial Reconstruction Team. We were in Iraq with Poles, with, with, with British forces, sort of uh, our presence, our flag was uh, basically everywhere where US and NATO troops were. And that was very conscientious, of course, uh, that was uh, very much at the expense of our defense sort of buying hardware, because uh, at some point we had, we were spending <coughs> about between 10 and 15 percent of our defense budget just on, on deployed uh, operations. But this was sort of, uh, we, these were sort of, we thought this as being normal, and uh, when I would sort of meet foreign, foreign audiences uh, in the past, I would sort of tell them this sort of Cinderella story of Lufina becoming sort of independent, transforming economy, politics from communism into market economy, and sort of that would be sort of very happy end. Uh, 
But since 2014, you know, well, things have changed. Things have changed, and uh, th these sort of good old days, uh, accession to NATO is a bit of prehistory. You know, we have our story now with uh, the new security situation, um, and uh, uh, and today, indeed, if you read NATO documents. Uh, uh, we are referred to the Baltic states and Poland to a lesser extent as uh, frontline countries or most vulnerable allies. And I think this is the perception which is now in, within the alliance, though some countries uh, sort of more agree with that, uh, others less, but, uh, but certainly uh, the overall policy is sort of that NATO has to do something about uh, the vulnerabilities and uh, security of, of this region. And indeed, it was only after 2014 when uh, NATO defense planners had a careful look at the security situation in the region. And the picture was not very pretty. Uh, I think uh, NATO was outmanned, outgunned uh, by far. Uh, readiness to escalate, readiness of decision making, uh, ability to move forces. Uh, nothing was uh, NATO's, to the NATO's advantage. And, and therefore, Right after that, we were sort of um, things have started to change. There were sort of two sorts of measures which were taken. Uh, there were sort of quick impact measures with uh, some NATO de deployment, initially symbolic and FIUs, uh, reinforced uh, air, air policing. Then, uh, as, as Rafael was showing on the map, uh, we have uh, NATO uh, en enhanced forward presence uh, in, uh, in the three Baltic countries, also in Poland and also. also in, in, in Romania. Uh, so this is indeed a very, very important uh, change and uh, that's uh, critical for, for the security and I will say a few words on that later. The other thing which has happened, NATO has started a uh, significant in-depth reform of, of uh, its uh, structures, uh, of its planning, uh, because uh, after 25 years of cuts, and there was uh, 25 years uh, since 1990 that defense budgets were going down overall within the alliance, and uh, with all these high tempo operations in Afghanistan and uh, other places, uh, you know, the, the forces, uh, NATO forces in Europe did not look good. They still don't look very good. Numbers seem to be alright, but when you sort of try to see how many units you have for as we call for for facing a peer peer uh, what's the term peer competitor peer competitor uh, well it's uh, there, there aren't that many and and indeed uh, therefore now we are looking uh, within the alliance very much and, and see what uh, how we can improve situation poland is indeed one of the countries which takes uh, this task very very seriously of uh, they always did uh, but uh, but now i, th I think uh, I heard somebody quoting, and Rafa will correct me, but uh, uh, Poland has more Leopard tanks than Germany does, uh, don't, don't you? Exactly, so this is again a uh, uh, symbol how, uh, how seriously your country is, is, is ta ta taking the task. And in, indeed, this transformation is, is uh, very much back to a future that we need to look uh, at some of the concepts from the past uh, which have worked uh, because the climate is in many ways comparable to the Cold War days, where deterrence was probably the key word uh, when dealing with the threat uh, from the East. So, so building a credible NATO posture, as we like to call it, uh, in the Baltics uh, and sort of ensuring deterrence is uh, something which is now uh, the most important task of the alliance, uh, I would say, and indeed, if NATO manages to solve the Baltics, you know, the rest will be easy, uh, because indeed, for due to po political, geographic uh, reasons, uh, it's, uh, it's the most uh, sort of uh, vulnerable part um, uh, of the alliance. I'm not saying that this threat is imminent, but uh, if one day Putin decides that he wants to sort of to challenge NATO, well, uh, Baltic states is sort of... Uh, the, the most natural place for him to, to, to do that. Uh, and, and, um, and therefore it's, 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 it's very important that NATO has an appropriate posture to, to make sure that uh, this, this idea it, it, it does not come to anybody's mind. Because uh, we sense that uh, Russia is overall is an opportunist power. Uh, <coughs> there is no sort of uh, clear strategy, but, uh, <coughs> but there is certainly they would uh, grab opportunities as we did in, in, in Ukraine and that I therefore weakness can be provocative. Uh, we 
we want to be sh sure and uh, NATO has to sort of make sure that uh, everybody in Kremlin understands that uh, if uh, they do something in the Baltic States, they will uh, face a united and determined alliance from day one. And therefore, the physical presence of more than 20 countries in the Baltic States is so important, because from day one, uh, all, uh, all countries, troops of so many countries are, uh, are there uh, facing the threat. Of course, we would like to see more U.S. presence, and uh, I just saw you have a very nice handout about uh, CEPA has, has made, and uh, Ray Wojciech, uh, could, could comment uh, about it afterwards, a uh, very nice study and very strong case for a stronger U.S. presence in, in the Baltics, which we like and appreciate very much. Well, the whole concept of deterrence is about, uh, has an uh, assumption that your opponent is rational, and, and indeed, we, we believe that, you know, that uh, people in Kremlin, they make calculated choices and therefore, you know, deterrence should, should be working uh, against a, a, a rational opponent and therefore uh, those uh, NATO decisions and presence uh, and readiness to reinforce the allies really, really, really matters and is so important. Finally, a couple of words on, on the sort of Lithuanian-Polish relationship. I think it's... it's um, it's our special duty as for our armed forces to keep the Suwalki corridor open uh, because that's the only land bridge to, to reinforce the rest of, 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 uh, of, the, of the Baltic countries uh, and therefore we try to work now very closely with the new Polish division and core core in, in Shetsin uh, we work bi bilaterally and, uh, and, uh, and also we welcome now very much the Polish uh, U.S. agreement to have uh, extra forces deployed to, 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 to Poland. Uh, uh, numbers are still uh, being discussed, I understand, but, uh, but I think it's, it's, it's very critical. And of course, we hope that U.S., as they normally do, we will not be looking sort of national, but they will take a regional approach. There will be antennas uh, in the Baltic countries because, uh, again, this security is so much interdependent. We are all very much in, 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 in the same boat. With this, I think I'll stop and uh, we'll be ready to, to discuss uh, any questions. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Great. Thank you, Roberto. Okay. So now we'll have uh, Ray Wojcik. All right. Are you good? Thank you. Uh, can you put up the map, the battlefield map? Sure. I don't know if that's still on. Yep, yep. It's a great map. Oh, that's good. So, my name is Ray Wojcik. I'm the director of the Center for European Policy Analysis in Warsaw, Poland. CEPA, Center for European Policy Analysis, is a uh, think tank based in Washington, D.C., American think tank, uh, with one office uh, in the region now, uh, but we hope in the future uh, we'll see more CEPA on the eastern flank. It's unique as an American think tank because we focus on the eastern flank of NATO. So think Estonia, to Bulgaria with Poland in the middle. Uh, that's our study area and we're the only think tank that does that. And because of that, and we have a great reputation, 15 years old, um, we enjoy great relationships uh, with our allies up and, down the, up and down the flank. Of course, we don't study uh, just what's going on in those countries and how we can help, but uh, it includes being expert on Russia and then the, the things going on in the EU, Germany in particular, and so forth. And the bottom line is our goal is to tighten the transatlantic bonds of our allies in the eastern flank to the United States and keep those strong. So that's one of our main efforts. Now uh, we'll start out with a, a little bit more advertisement since uh, since Robertus mentioned it. Uh, so one of the reports that I brought today just for an example of stuff we do, well, we don't sell anything by the way, just, just I brought some <laughs> extra copies, but this one is a report we did last November that talks about this idea of permanent presence of U.S. forces on NATO's eastern flank, starting with Poland. So that was the focus of this report. We believe this report had strong influence in Washington, D.C. over the last several months, which has helped the policy debate on what is shaping as a new significant uh, U.S. presence uh, coming to Poland, uh, probably in the next, well, you'll see in the next 12 months, basically. A lot of details of those that are worried or concerned about what President Trump said or President Duda said recently, a lot of the details of what was discussed and what was 
what was promulgated in the agreement uh, at the White House a few days ago uh, will take until September to sort of uh, spell out. So there's, there's still more to come on that. So I wanted to start off, of course, with the advertisement there, uh, just thanking uh, everybody for coming today and being interested in, uh, in this panel. I think it's a unique panel for um, this conference, and it's wonderful just to be able uh, to participate in this uh, Piazza uh, conference um, under, the, uh, under the auspices of the relationships with Poland, um, the cities of Gdynia and Gdańsk, and then uh, and also the leadership in this region. So it's really an opportunity for us. And it's also great today, uh, again, to be with my two uh, good uh, allies uh, uh, next to me, Lithuania and Poland. I feel like uh, I've been around the region so long that I'm very uh, close to these uh, two countries. And actually, for this, for this discussion, having two model allies, Steve said earlier, the Lithuania, Poland, they're good allies. I would say they're great allies. They are the model allies for, uh, for NATO, and they're, and they're, of course, in the region. Uh, they're both leaders. Different capabilities, different size, capacities. And again, I, I agree totally with uh, what Roberta says, you know, trying to punch above their weight. And Poland's been doing the same thing, like Lithuania, for uh, a couple decades. And so I want to start off with the famous uh, Polish military model, which I, uh, motto, which I hope one day becomes the motto of NATO for our freedom and yours, which uh, I think everybody in this room is probably familiar with or, or have heard over the centuries, this, uh, what's sort of become the Polish uh, famous military model. Because I think uh, it's exemplar. And what Rafa was saying about um, the security relationships, you know, Polish infantry company going to Romania, Romania infantry. This is all sort of based in in the NATO ethos. This idea of we all support one another. So I think that that was a very important point that Rafa made there. And then also for Robertus talking about uh, being a security provider again, talking about the idea of punching above the weight these all these newer allies in the eastern flank for uh, the better part of a couple decades. Having been around Poland a significant amount of time and spending some time understanding what Poland has uh, been up to, let's say the last 30 years, you know, if you think about it, and not too many people remember, even in Desert Storm in 1990, Poland participated with us. There were even some other allies, Czech Republic, for example, supported us in even 1990, one year after the wall uh, falls. They're, they're deploying already. Uh, I think Rafa was referring actually to the Balkans operations. We talk about joining NATO operations before, but even even after 1990, again for Poland in Haiti in 1994, long before the Balkans ops uh, begin, mm -hmm. Poland is there with the United States uh, helping us in a very difficult security st uh, situation in Haiti. So now I want to just kind of bring in the anniversary point that Steve uh, <coughs> Steve referred to this NATO 70th anniversary. And I heard uh, Rafa allude to it uh, here earlier about um, the beginning of World War II, of course, in this area, Vesterplatte, very close to Gdańsk. And of course, soon, it'll be the 80th, we're in the 80th year of the invasion of uh, Nazi Germany and uh, the Soviet Union of 1939. So that's a significant anniversary to remember in the context of defending and securing this region uh, from Russian aggression in, in modern times. Also, I just want to note a couple other important anniversaries that are sort of occurring on the, on, around uh, this time. Uh, one of them is uh, D-Day, and you guys all in the last few weeks have seen the explosion of material from a lot of it from an American perspective for us Americans about what happened at D-Day and so forth. But um, it's very important to remember there were a lot of allies that participate in the Normandy operation. Poland doesn't land on D-Day. But Poland participates in the Normandy campaign in a significant way uh, towards the, actually towards the end of the campaign because of Polish contribution and being the fourth largest allied army in World War II, that actually helps uh, seal the final uh, defeat of the Germans in, in, in Normandy. So that's significant. And then the 75th anniversary, of course, of the Warsaw Uprising coming up here in a couple months in, in August is also uh, good to remember what uh, what was going on in this these periods of time that were uh, devastating, but also uh, what's the right word? Very heroic periods of time uh, of allies uh, contributing and fighting for each other. And in this case, of Warsaw Uprising, um, it, even more uh, of a uh, situation about 
why it's so important for allies to stay together because Poland, as we know, virtually ended up fighting alone during the Warsaw Uprising. So with that, uh, I want to move into uh, talking about um, what happened in the beginning of these uh, recent uh, security um, bolstering of the eastern flank. So it was a, a privilege for me to be in the American Embassy a few years ago when we got a phone call from United States Army Europe and, and uh, Steve mentioned General Hodges who's actually the commander back then and General Hodges is a member of SEPA at this point. But back then uh, we got a call from those guys and it said uh, yeah, we are bringing an American uh, unit to Poland and it's going to be called Operation Atlantic Resolve. This was going to be the name of this operation that was going to begin the bolstering of this eastern flank. And notice that this beginning step as far as ground forces, because air forces had already come in about a month and a half before the United States launched a, a bunch of fighter aircraft, uh, uh, 14 fighter aircraft into Poland uh, and then to support uh, all the region for up, upgraded uh, security and defense and reconnaissance during this period. But a month and a half later, the ground forces come and during that period of time, we get this phone call at the embassy, hey, we're going to bring in this uh, American unit. No, okay, which, which unit are we talking about? Well, there's uh, the Airborne Brigade we have uh, on constant basis in Vicenza. We're going to send a company of paratroopers. Actually, sounds very, very small compared to what we have in the region today as far as security forces. And so we're going to bring an airborne company. Okay, this is great. This is fantastic. So tell the Poles that we're bringing this company and they're staying, you know, for a long period of time. This is not an exercise. This is not routine. You know, when we do exercises, we, we brought in uh, companies and battalions and, and things for many years and op uh, operate and, and uh, participate with Poland in a number of uh, activities, but this was going to be different. So when we talked to uh, the United States Army Europe and European Command, we said, well, you know, it would probably be good, you know, this is actually Ray Wojcik, the attache, probably be good if we ask the Poles if it's okay if we do this. You know, they are a sovereign nation and we know for years Poland has been saying we want more Americans, we want permanent, you know, we know that. We know that's, a, that's without question a government policy for, for a couple decades to increase U.S. presence. But you don't go to a good ally and just say, hey, by the way, we're dropping in a bunch of paratroopers, and uh, do you have some barracks uh, where they can stay and they have a place to train? So we did that. And, and so we had one week period, uh, General, not General Hodges, but a general came from U.S. Army Europe, and the Poles rapidly assembled everybody you can imagine at the General Staff on Rakowiecka Street. And we had this big discussion, and it was kind of interesting because I, I, I know the Poles so well, and I know the generals, I talked to them before the American general came. And, uh, and of course, they're in the room in a small setting. The Polish generals are like, oh, but this is great, this is great. But when we sat and had the meeting, you know, about 50 guys on each side of this table, and uh, there's a senior Polish general in the middle, and then our guys. And, uh, our, well, we'd like to bring, this is the American, we'd like to bring uh, this paratrooper unit, and, and then Poles are over there looking like, hmm, well, we have to think about that. <laughs> and then, okay, we'll do it. You know, it was, was kind of like that. So it was all great news because we're great allies, but it was good we went through the steps, you know, to make sure uh, we were invited. Uh, the one nuance to that, though, when we talk about security and deterrence, and, and uh, Robertus was talking about it's really important what that looks like. Um, there was a decision, and it was at the White House level, unfortunately, that uh, when that just one single company of paratroopers came, we had organized, the uh, Americans were going to parachute out of their airplane, land in Świdwin, Świdwin's uh, airfield in northwest Poland, and then a Polish uh, company, a sister company, Airborne, was going to do the same thing. It was a partnered uh, operation, and it was going to demonstrate this combined result. Unfortunately, at the last minute, the White House said, that would be too, too uh, provocative to have 120 Americans landing in Poland, even though we've done that on numerous exercises. So this is, this is part of the challenge, and I want to uh, kind of get to uh, what I call the three C's, and not the three C's initiative uh, three C's, but, uh, and I, I appreciate what Rafa reminded us about uh, of the three R's, response, readiness, and reinforcement, that kind of the, the NATO buzzword, where we need to go. But I also want to use this, uh, this construct to talk about the security uh, apparatus in this region. 
cohesion, the cohesion of NATO and these other organizations in Europe. We heard about the V9, the V4, the EU, and so forth. Uh, being able to work together and have a common uh, picture of what the real threats are so that we can respond cohesively. Coherence, uh, a second uh, C, uh, to think about, okay, do we have the right mix of forces? Do we have the right connectivity to talk to our allies, whether it's radio or other means? And when there's a crisis and the Russians jam all the radios and they jam the GPS, do we have alternate means? So this sort of coherence and then capabilities. And when I say capabilities, I'm talking about the military equipment, uh, the presence of forces forward ready to respond. So those are kind of the way I, I frame those uh, three C's. So with that, I just want to uh, review the bidding since 2014, but we should think back significantly where NATO missed a few things in the last uh, 20 years. So if you think about 2007, this major cyber attack, that was a awakening uh, in Estonia, a NATO, um, actually not, yeah, a NATO ally and at that point. And then, uh, and then what was, uh, what we were looking at as a future long-term problem, this, this first wave of this denial of service that occurred in Estonia in 2007. Um, then we see also uh, around the same uh, period, this, uh, uh, or actually earlier, this, this period where Russia creates a frozen conflict in Moldova. And then we see in 2008 significant um, aggression by the Russians in Georgia. So we should not, not forget these three things that precede 2014, which we all mark as the watershed of how we need to respond in the region. What happened in Ukraine? The annexation, the illegal annexation of uh, Crimea and then this continued uh, 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 provocation and, um, and uh, um, uh, underpinning of the war in eastern Ukraine done by Russia. So uh, I just want to remind us that there was a beginning earlier to this when Russia started turning uh, the wrong way on democratic reform and NATO missed some signals. And what we're trying to do today as NATO, as an organization in the West, is try to increase um, those three R's that Rafa, you know, response, readiness, and reinforcement, so that we don't miss the signals. I would argue today, NATO is still, you know, across the board, a little bit, or maybe even a lot, back on our heels when it comes to Russian uh, activity. And one of the reasons is because the Russians aren't hitting us conventionally head to head, where we know, uh, we have overmatch. The United States leading NATO, we have total overmatch of any Russian capability if we put our minds to it and we have a kinetic Article 5 sort of conflict. But those things that Russia does below Article 5, we call it, um, which the Article 5 demands a NATO response, uh, those things are ambiguous. Those things like cyber attacks, those things, disinformation. When do you call that? When, when do we say uh, we're at war right now? And many would, would tell you in this room right now, we are at, essentially at war uh, with the Russians right now on different fronts in different domains, uh, but we're not, at least a NATO perspective, we're not at our Article 5 uh, conflict. But because of what the Russians have done in Crimea, uh, in Ukraine, what they've done before, what they continue to do in Syria, they're stirring up problems for the United States in in uh, far-flung places like Venezuela. Uh, and now, recently, the CIA Azov, as they try to um, uh, uh, make, uh, use legal means, uh, declaring international waters, Russian waters, essentially trying to annex the CIA Azov. So this continues. We see that NATO has not done enough uh, to uh, deter the Russians. But looking back, in 2014, because of the deteriorating situation, uh, the NATO summit in 2014 was significant. The Wales summit, and then I'll talk about the Warsaw summit a little bit, and then I'll talk about the 2018 uh, Brussels summit. So at the Wales summit, we get on good, good format. Okay, so um, this is when the readiness action plan is announced by NATO, and the readiness action plan includes these deployments that I kind of started to bring up, which nowadays you see anywhere between four and 5,000 Americans on the eastern flank at all times, uh, virtually on rotational basis uh, operating in this region. It includes upgraded maritime patrolling, cooperation with allies, Air Force to Air Force patrolling and reconnaissance upgrades. It also meant that we established something called the BJTF. Um, so there's been something called the NATO Response Force uh, developed for years to react quickly to a crisis. But as NATO looked at it in 2014, this organization, NATO Response Force, was not really ready 
to respond quickly to anything. It was more of a paper tiger, to be honest. So this very high readiness task force, 5,000 soldiers um, of uh, uh, Air Force, Navy, uh, Army, Special Ops, can quickly be deployed within a few days to a crisis spot uh, to bolster or respond to a security situation. Then the NATO response force, the larger force behind it, was also increased significantly in size. So we're talking today, this force that was about 13,000 five years ago is now a 40,000 plus uh, size force with 5,000 being ready to go in just a few days. So that's a significant change. NATO has done very well in creating this force. NATO has raised the uh, level of capability of something called the Multinational Corps uh, Northeast uh, in Poland. It's and uh, I was going to point to it, but. Uh, it's, it's on there. there. It's yeah. on there. That's, yeah, it's there. It's right there. And so this is significant. General Breedlove, uh, Supreme Allied Commander NATO at the time, said this is the one core. There's nine of these in NATO. This is the one the farthest east. It's in Poland. We're going to make this core have a special mission just to worry about the northeastern part of, uh, of Poland. This was significant. And the Poles argued and argued and argued and pushed hard to make this uh, core, which was really at half, half staff. Uh, at full staff and, and ready to go, and they did a good job of doing that. Poland established the Multinational Division Northeast, which is an Elbong, as Rafa talked about, and then the Romanians have established something called the Multinational Division Southeast. So new division structures, and then Rafa talked about in Article 3 since uh, Poland developing even more division national capability. EFP is shown on the map, as uh, Rafa talked about, and then uh, that's called Enhanced Forward Presence. These are these four battle groups, uh, most uh, combined NATO uh, Army forces in Estonia, uh, Latvia, Poland, and Lithuania. And the job, of they're, they're essentially a tripwire. No, everybody knows, even during the Cold War, American forces forward on the Folded Gap were a tripwire waiting for reinforcements of America. These are tripwire forces as well. They don't have full capability to defend. A, a determined Russian enemy trying to uh, cross into NATO territory. And that's why it's so important what uh, Roberta said about the Sovalki area. This is that land strip 65 kilometers long uh, between Lithuania and Poland that the Russians could close very easily and cut off three NATO allies instantly and then we would be fighting a war of liberation. So the goal is to deter the Russians to ensure that they don't do something like that, don't take advantage of the situation and not look at um, the idea that we can just continue to have coffee talks with the Russians and, don't, and, and pretend like we don't want to provoke them. We need to take the measures we need to take as the West and NATO to uh, show the Russians that we're serious, that not one inch of NATO territory is going to be uh, taken by the Russians in an aggressive way. So with that, um, in 2016, I okay. In 2016, the Warsaw Summit comes, and uh, by this time, the uh, NATO re response force is fully, uh, fully up and ready. It's tripled in size. These uh, NATO force integration units, actually, Rafa mentioned these two. There's one in each of the flank countries except the Czech Republic, and there's 40 soldiers in each of these. These NATO force integration units are very important, small headquarters elements that help response forces come into each country as needed. Um, also, in uh, 2016, uh, NATO declared that cyber is a domain that we have to be ready to fight and win. And so this was a significant step. Uh, the nuclear force posture was reviewed in 2016, and then there was renewed emphasis. It happened in 14 and renewed in 16. Of NATO allies need to spend 2% of their GDP on on uh, on defense spending and 20% of their defense spending on capital uh, equipment. I'm proud to say our two allies here are in that small club of seven uh, that do that. So that's a, that's great on them. And then also ballistic missile defense. We heard that before. Hit uh, initial operational capability. We set up a site in Romania that is actually full operationally capable to defend against Russian, actually defend against rogue missile threats. And uh, I want to be clear that these missile defense sites, one's going to be in Poland in next year, are targeting uh, rogue missile uh, cr countries like Iran and, and in the past it was Syria. And then finally we get to 2018. Big unveiling that it's overshadowed a little bit. The Brussels summit, uh, a lot of discussion about uh, President Trump making a comment about how much uh, the, the building cost and, and so forth. But the Brussels summit was significant too. Um, NATO, uh, again, trying to be more responsive and more ready, declared this new initiative called 30-30-30-30 
it meant uh, 30 battalions, 30 ships, and 30 squadrons of aircraft ready to go in 30 days. So this is an initiative that's actually still in development that NATO's trying to make itself more responsive. NATO developed something called counter-hybrid teams uh, that are ready to deploy uh, to a country that is having serious difficulty in hybrid war problems with the Russians. And then um, there was a huge agreement in 2018 of cooperation with the European Union and NATO. This is very, very significant because going back to the cohesion of uh, these European Western organizations, uh, we all know in this room that there's a lot of friction between uh, either countries or organizations. And so over the years, there's been this idea to make the EU, you know, this separate military entity, and where does that go? What does that mean? Um, by and large, um, things are fairly stable, but there's still new initiatives going on in, uh, in the EU to uh, do some interesting <laughs> security things. Also, um, then I'll, I'll finish with... Uh, with this uh, couple points that, uh, that are going on at the EU level. EU has announced something called PESCO. It's an effort to have military cooperation on uh, acquisition and programs within the EU nations. Of course, that leaves the United States out, and the United States supports everything the EU does on a security front as long as it bolsters capabilities in Europe, uh, but doesn't cut the United States out uh, for you know, uh, not being a partner in some of these activities. So this is a good initiative, and most significant in that initiative is a focus on military mobility as one of the key programs, because the United States Army has learned in the last four years it's very difficult to move forces, even from Germany to the eastern flank or to respond to the Baltics because of mobility problems. So that's a, a major effort that we're working on. So I'll finish with, you know, back to you. For our freedom of yours, that's what it's all about. I'm ready to answer your questions. Cohesion, coherence, capabilities, and response readiness and reinforcement. These are the things that NATO and the West need to focus on to improve our posture to ensure Russia takes no, uh, makes no mistake about a miscalculation uh, against a NATO partner, a NATO country or, or partner. Thank you. All right, great, thanks. Okay, so thank you very much to, uh, to all of our panelists. And, uh, they really accomplished what I wanted to do, which was to take a look at NATO from a regional perspective and a, really the national perspective of particularly Lithuania and Poland and then to look at a little more broadly regionally and then an alliance wide and uh, so I really thank everyone for coming I think we have an interesting mix of people particularly thank uh, Professor Blobaum for coming the president of, of, uh, of Piazza and Professor Jim Pullo for sitting in Jim was the uh, primary organizer for this uh, for this event uh, so with that, we will open it up for questions. We have about uh, 20 minutes. We'll let you guys just stay in your seats. And uh, who wants to, to start it off? Yes, sir. I have probably too many questions, but as I'm thinking, I'm, the general question to somebody who wants to pick it up is about the future of NATO. Because I see a couple of uh, biggest challenges to NATO. One comes from the east, one comes from the west. Uh, with all due respect for the presenters, I don't think uh, uh, I'm very critical of the annexation of, of the Crimea, but I don't think that was the first change of borders in Europe. I think Kosovo was the first, and I think that's how Russia would argue um, that uh, you know, why, why NATO were members of NATO supportive of, uh, uh, of Crimea, but not of uh, Serbia under those circumstances. And I see Russia as, as chipping away at NATO. Um, you mentioned the eastern uh, flank of NATO, arguably the easternmost member of NATO is Turkey, and, and uh, Russia has been making some significant inroads in Turkey, which to some extent I think are, are weakening uh, of NATO. Um, the other challenge I think is, uh, uh, is uh, President uh, Trump's approach. He, he mentioned quite bluntly, what is NATO for? And he was asking about Germans, uh, for example, purchasing gas from Russia. Uh, it was a very contractual approach to, uh, to NATO. Right? Why, do I, why do we defend uh, NATO countries if we're not getting economic benefits from this? Something that I'm sure Lithuania and Poland would take issues with. I right? think most people in this room would have a different perspective on NATO. Um, but that leads to my question. What's the future of NATO? What's the future of relations? Uh, I know that the, the, the perspective that um, one of the uh, presenters, Mr. Wojcik, uh, presented sounded uh, optimistic, but uh, we did fail on a number of occasions. But what is to prevent us from failing again? Russia, uh, to my mind, is, is responding. Uh, to, uh, 
or at least when you present the presentation that um, uh, Mr. Sopranos mentioned that the Lithuania made it into the, the doors just before the doors closed, the argument could also be made that Lithuania and other countries provoked Russia to respond. Um, right? In other words, it's, this may or may not have happened, but now it does. Uh, and, and we are on on board to do something about it. So, that's yeah. my lengthy. No, that, and, and I tell you, that's a, that's a great question because uh, you know, ultimately the alliance is made up of individual sovereign states. So they have their own national perspectives. Then we want to look at something uh, that's going to be the alliance perspective. Uh, I think particularly what you said about Turkey concerns a lot of people. Um, and then President Trump did bring that up very specifically about the, uh, the gas, um, uh, the Nord Stream uh, issue. And so, you know, any alliance, and uh, you know, they always like to uh, like to remind you when you go to uh, to NATO headquarters in Brussels, you know, it is a consensus organization, and so everyone gets a vote. So once you are a member, we're all we're all in this uh, together, and that is makes things not easy, but it's not easy for a reason. So I, I think that's a great question to look forward to uh, the challenges and maybe the opportunities uh, for the alliance. So if one of you gentlemen would like to jump on that one first. Well, thank you. A lot, a lot to chew on. Uh, thanks for, for focus. I can choose uh, which, which, which bits I like to chew on. Uh, <laughs> on, on this particular uh, Russia responding uh, to sort of bo Baltic admission, you, you would say that, that that then means you accept the logic that Russia has a right to decide on the sort of security choice of, of its neighbors. Because why else would you respond? Uh, forces have not been, any NATO forces have been deployed to the region until 2014. That's, that was NATO's response already in sort of in a, in the military. Until that <coughs> well, the NATO's approach was to, well, we will deal with our friends somehow. Russia is not going to invade you, and we are sort of living in a sort of, we can uh, try to develop a relation with Russia one way or another. And until 2008, the largest Baltic exercise was Baltops, which we currently have in the Baltic. So we didn't have Russia as a full-fledged participant. <coughs> So NATO was indeed trying uh, to engage Russia into, into it, but uh, now, well, indeed, uh, uh, the approach uh, of you know, Russian leadership is that, well, we have the right to, to, to shape their, their neighborhood uh, and, uh, and very much they're uh, also sort of trying to, to, to solve their internal problems, uh, democracy, whatever, is through foreign policy. And, uh, it seems that uh, President Putin is very much keen about foreign policy. That's his sort of, that's where he's engaged. The rest is left to the government to, to handle. On the challenges to NATO, uh, you mentioned Turkey, and I think uh, it is, uh, Turkey has a particular geographic situation, particular environment, and it's not sort of, uh, it's, it's an ally with significant forces and, and valuable ally, if you will, but uh, this is still, I would see, as inter-family dispute, which NATO had, a, a, well, Greek-Turkish problem, for example, was on alliance agenda, and uh, where, where arguments were still, you know, kind of moved on and, uh, and succeeded, and I think uh, we sh should be able, and the uh, U.S. in particular, should be able to handle that. Of course, the decision now to buy Russian systems is, is not something, you know, uh, anybody in the alliance should be welcoming, and this is sort of, the current trend is, is worrying. <coughs> Two other uh, elements which I see for sort of uh, which worry me uh, perhaps even more than the Turkish case is is the sort of politics and the uh, fragility of a transatlantic link. I think we cannot complain much here in the region with U.S. sort of physical presence, military exercise versus more. You know the facts on the ground are good, but the spirit, you know, the talk uh, from. The the outlaw of some of the summits, you know, the public messaging is not of unity. Uh, and I think this, this counts. Uh, and indeed, this transactional approach, sort of, you, 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 you can feel it, it's a bit brittle, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm very glad that we have uh, Congress, Senate so very much support, and I think that this, this matters. But, uh, but big, the high politics is, 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 is important. The, the, the other challenge, which I think you have not mentioned, I thought you had in mind when you said in the, from the East, uh, yeah, but uh, that was a closing, that was Turkey. Uh, I think China is another challenge. Yeah. In a sense that uh, future, in 10 years, uh, future security relationship in the world will be shaped by US-China competition. And, and the US will therefore look at the alliance they have for the prism of how much do they contribute to that. 
And therefore, if now European countries sort of become too much, you know, too friendly to sell too many of their port facilities, uh, 5G, whatever, you know, suddenly the US may say, well, well that doesn't help uh, our, our case. It doesn't help the competition we have. So I think uh, this is uh, the role, sort of, what, uh, what role will future NATO have in sort of containing NATO, uh, containing China, probably not the right way containing, but something else. Then, uh, Political science will invent something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, uh, I think uh, here's a long term challenge for, for the lines. Okay. Good. Uh, can Ray I just, uh, with, yeah. just on the China point? Well, actually, just going back to your points. Uh, so clearly, NATO has uh, been through many crises crises in the past, and when you talk about just the beginning of NATO and all this debate of how it was going to form, it was really uh, controversial, putting NATO together. And then you think about the Suez crisis, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, and then you think about the Iraq war and all the, all the uh, really uh, harsh criticism of uh, the American president then, um, and then, uh, you know, our, uh, you know, just go it alone and take whoever wants to go with us uh, to Iraq. Uh, this is going to break a NATO kind of period of time. So we, somehow we've managed to get through all that. Um, we do have a common uh, threat uh, at various levels. The challenge is wherever you sit geographically in Europe, that threat picture is uh, definitely different. And for Turkey, you know, that's a great example. In Germany, for example. Um, and I want to tie this back to this idea of uh, forward presence of American forces and deterrence. So, so for two reasons, or you know, we, we argue for many reasons from SEPA why a permanent assignment of U.S. forces in the region is important, and one of them is connected to the China issue, and that is uh, it could be you know within 10, 15 years uh, we're at a kinetic uh, conventional conflict or some other kind of conflict with China, and if the United States attention and military power has to be focused into the Pacific. What does that mean for Europe if Russia continues on the same trajectory? And so uh, one of the reasons that we argue, for example, there's uh, just one piece of the U.S. presence here now is something called the Division Forward. It's been called the Mission Command Elements in Pose 9. So in Pose 9, there's about 90 Americans that represent a portion of an American division staff. And so one of the cases we've made is if we can increase that division staff element to a full American division staff, and you look at one of the only countries in Europe that actually <coughs> takes division structure seriously, Poland, and we can raise the level uh, over a period of time, years, of the capabilities of the Polish divisions because of these interactions. This is one of the arguments about permanent presence. Not only is it sending a deterrence message, it's an assurance capability thing, but it's also an interoperability uh, capability development opportunity that uh, gets missed a lot. It's just, you know, some people uh, look at uh, American forces coming out here uh, kind of in this view that you said. It's, it's just, it's costing us. Uh, the Russians uh, don't really seem to be crossing the line that much. Uh, Ukraine, that seems like a distance, a battle. Now, uh, one of the best examples I've heard of this permanent presence, not permanent presence issue, see how I've turned it over to my, 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 my desire to talk about it, is that uh, on a panel uh, about six months ago somewhere, uh, a Polish moderator uh, was having a French uh, uh, ambassador speak about um, this idea about permanent presence. And the French ambassador said, I don't understand why this is so important. Uh, the U.S. bases, U.S. forces in Germany are ready to respond. They're all in good, good operational uh, uh, locations. Uh, this is a lot of money. Why is it so important? And then uh, he said, uh, the Polish moderator, very smart, he said, you know, if you uh, make this argument that having American forces off the front line, uh, in fact, even the ones here today, all back in Germany or farther west, then during the Cold War, what would you say if we had told the West Germans we should just move everything we have in West Germany to Normandy and just wait for the Soviets to invade. And then from Normandy, then we'll attack again and push the Soviets out. It just doesn't make sense when you think about real visible uh, presence and assurance. And then the final thing on Turkey, super complicated. We've done a lot of study and work on the Black Sea issues, and Turkey is a giant uh, uh, challenge to sort of um, uh, understand the relationship with Russia and how we can keep them uh, close as a close ally. And as, as my colleague mentioned, the F-35 
uh, challenge for us right now is if if they uh, if we continue to sell them the F-35, most modern aircraft in the world, and they buy so, uh, so they buy Russian air defense systems, uh, that's a, just a non-starter. And then if they lose the F-35 program, that takes them out as an important uh, air force ally in that in that part of uh, Europe. So that's a that's a big challenge. We've got to work it out though with them, and I think that. Um, NATO's come through crises, and we'll get through this one. That's my. Ralph, if you'd like to have a quick comment on that, we'll get uh, to the next question. Can we briefly, briefly refer to um, what you mentioned that, uh, that um, uh, Russia is criticizing uh, some NATO's actions uh, in general? It's a general pattern that they provide many arguments against uh, NATO uh, particular uh, initiatives. Um, well, so uh, as I mentioned, uh, of course, um, it's a part of this uh, well, general disinformation uh, um, techniques, which which are in fact part uh, of the hybrid uh, tactics, which are used quite extensively uh, by Russia. Obviously, uh, they, mm, so uh, it's in in fact Russia considers this. Uh, uh, more, uh, we can say more soft instruments of uh, uh, gaining influence in in different countries as part of of their strategy. So they are constantly using uh, it, and these, in fact, uh, narratives uh, that you mentioned, be it about Kosovo or other things. Um, are in fact designed as part of these disinformation campaigns and uh, NATO is aware of this. In fact, it is considered as, as part of the security <coughs> landscape in which we are. And uh, so, yeah, there is a really high awareness of this within NATO and al uh, also NATO is uh, putting much effort on uh, communications, on uh, explaining, in fact, the wider public, the uh, the different issues. There is the public diplomacy division within NATO, and uh, in, in fact, it's not, of course, to uh, like counter propaganda with more <laughs> propaganda from the side of NATO. But there is this effort of, uh, we can say, a communications campaign that tries to explain, to give uh, arguments uh, based on facts uh, that are explaining different issues that may be easily uh, misunderstood in, uh, uh, in terms of NATO response to different things. Okay, great. That, that, was a, that was a very good question. We could have gone on for that in a long time. Uh, Robert. Yeah, I have actually two questions. I'll try to keep them brief. Uh, I, I'm interested in the you know issues of cybersecurity, disinformation, manipulation, uh, social media. Uh, Poland, Lithuania, along with many other European countries, recently held elections. Right to the European Parliament. Yeah. So I, 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 I'm okay. interested in what kind of security threats we received, what kind of, uh, as much as can be revealed, uh, what kind of actions were taken to 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 secure the integrity uh, of those of those elections. Uh, and this could also be turned around the American side because we're, we're entering a, a new season, uh, as it were. Uh, with 23 candidates and how many primaries and uh, uh, and, and eventually a general a general election. Uh, the other question is that uh, those of us who perhaps viewed the role of the United States and NATO through a different lens than the current current occupant of the White House, um, uh, were nonetheless rather reinsured by the presence of General Mattis in the Pentagon. And so he has departed. And so, uh, I don't know, it seemed like his presence was a, a, a confirmation of the continuation of, I don't know, this more traditional role of the United States in, in, in NATO. So with his departure, his, you know, has the calculus changed at all? Um, Great. Yeah, so maybe our two uh, national reps can take the question about uh, the elections and Ray, if you want to comment on kind of the transition and leadership at the uh, DoD. Okay, uh, on cybersecurity, uh, yeah, and with this uh, manipulations, 
Well, European elections, you know, it's, it's different from the U.S. presidential elections. Where you, it's clear, you know, there's a difference if Hillary or Donald wins. Uh, in European elections, it's less clear. It's, 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 a, it's a motley crew of parties, you know, some are... Uh, uh, so it's uh, harder to roost for one, you know, or uh, in some countries maybe, but uh, in case for Lithuania, you know, now I think all politics are sort of, it's, uh, it's easy to be unpatriotic. In a way, it's uh, even difficult to, to, to have a healthy debate about Russia, Belarus, because, you know, now it's, we are sort of, we have a sort of healthy degree of paranoia, I would say, about this whole, whole thing. So all parties are sort of very patriotic, the media is quite patriotic in our country. So it's, it's a very difficult operating environment, I would say, <coughs> for those hybrid influences. And, uh, none of our politicians would, would love to be in the same picture of Russian ambassador just by, by, by accident, because, you know, that could ruin political career. I mean, this is uh, the, the change of climate which we have uh, currently uh, after two, two, 2014. At the same time, do we have cyber attacks? Uh, yes, uh, yes, for us. Most of them are cheap shots, uh, testing, testing the system. Uh, but uh, certainly there are bigger capabilities available. You know, on the other side, uh, often they are deployed against Ukraine, uh, tested there, and then we can end up uh, in, in different places. Therefore, we certainly pay a lot of attention to that. And, uh, and, uh, and the threat of potential manipulation, I think, now has stopped the debate in our country on possible uh, sort of uh, computer voting. Uh, uh, so we, we thought we could uh, sort of follow Estonians and uh, sort of have uh, uh, to allow sort of voting from, from home. Uh, but, but now uh, I think uh, it, it's uh, it, it stopped. On, on secondary matters, just a couple of points. I, I think we uh, really was. Uh, good counterpart for us. Uh, he understood the region. He traveled to the region. Uh, he was a strong uh, proponent of NATO big time. We a bit sort of we had arguments with his sort of approach to defense or both. I would say his uh, he had this dynamic uh, response uh, concept that you basically you want to be strategically predictable that you, U.S. will come and respond, but operationally predictable so you don't know from which corner we come. And I think here in the Baltic states we crave for some predictability. Yes. In the region and forces in the region is sort of which gives a reassurance, assurance, and uh, that's why we say you don't know. You can come from wherever, you, from wherever you want, but still you, you need better have a good time and also. In terms of the cyber uh, security and different threats, of course, they can concern not only the the elections, but uh, uh, of course the um, the domains that can be concerned by these cyber attacks are uh, quite multiple. And uh, of course, Poland is, uh, is undertaking, as I even mentioned uh, during the presentation, that we are uh, developing uh, substantially our uh, cyber defense capabilities and also the defense sector or the defense ministry takes part in this effort. And in fact, it's a countrywide uh, um, effort uh, driven by, uh, by different ministries depending on the, <coughs> on the sectors. Uh, because we have, we have even the, even the, well, since already a um, couple of years, uh, 2010, if I'm not mistaken, we have had the separate Ministry of Digital Affairs, uh, which is uh, also dealing with uh, this uh, cyber security issues. Uh, and this year's uh, parliamentary elections, well, European Parliament elections, uh, uh, were uh, a very good example. In fact, in terms of, for example, uh, counting votes, it went uh, really smoothly in Poland because, in fact, the next day we had the full uh, results from every uh, committees. Of course, these votes are counted uh, first, uh, like manually, and then the data is introduced in, in the system. Uh, so the the rapidity of this process. Uh, especially the, the 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 turnout was quite high this uh, this year, so m many votes were casted, and uh, <laughs> this process were uh, went surprisingly um, smoothly. So no, there were no uh, issues with this uh, this year in Poland. Um, uh, and about uh, the uh, was Secretary Matis and uh, his, uh, the change of the Secretary of Defense. Uh, no, there is there is a continuity in fact because even if, if in this case of uh, like um, 
of increase the U.S. military presence. We can give it as an example that uh, the, the talks about this issue uh, or this, this project uh, were held uh, before. Of course, there were extensive talks with uh, with the uh, Pentagon staff uh, and. Uh, under Secretary Mattis, and uh, now, of course, uh, the deal was concluded uh, with um, well, uh, during the period of uh, <coughs> Mr. Shanahan. So, so there is, uh, we see, there is a conti continuity of policies between okay. the two. So let, let, let's stop on that question. We are over time, so uh, I'm going to take one more question. But if anyone has to leave, please feel free. We actually have the room, so maybe we'll try to get two more questions before we finish up. Tell me. Just a quick question. <clears throat> With the warming of the optic circle and the evident, at least I, as far as I understand it, uh, militarization of Russian Federation's alluvial lands on the Arctic, is there any thought that NATO could be outflanked by the Arctic uh, in the future as the seas become more receptive not only for commercial but also for naval and military yeah. implications? That, that, that's a good question. I tell you, that's, uh, the United States is very interested in that and all of the countries, what they call the high north, everyone that has an interest there for economics but as well as uh, you know, strategic military. Uh, so we'll let our national friends take a shot at that if you and want. You, you asked me the right, that's uh, I think U.S. is most concerned. Okay, uh, yeah, since <laughs> we might have to ask our further <laughs> northern neighbors. Right. But uh, okay, Ray, can we take that? Report. But um, <laughs> one, one of the reasons that uh, SEPA has taken on a project this year, uh, starting from January, goes into early next year to <coughs> deliver to the NATO uh, summit, the deliverable for it. Um, it's called the coherence project, one of the three C words I mentioned, uh, because when you look at <clears throat> the differences in the security posture of what NATO's doing in the Black Sea right now, what NATO's doing in the Baltic Sea in the north, um, you can see that there are different approaches and there's challenges in each region. This project I mentioned will include um, issues dealing with the high north, uh, because you're, you're absolutely right. This is becoming a bigger and bigger problem. And those those allies up there, Nor Nor Norway, uh, Finland, Sweden, are very concerned about the militarization. So from um, a NATO perspective, NATO perspective uh, needs to consider the ability of the Russian Northern Fleet to, uh, to use those, uh, those open water uh, passageways, these military uh, missile bases that they put in to defeat uh, NATO forces um, this is a major future threat for us, and we need to have that in our overall 360, as, as NATO refers to it, uh, strategy of how we deal with threats uh, from the center of Europe and spoke out. <coughs> a couple of points on the market. I think there is a high potential for conflict then. Resources, uh, you know, Russia is now in a case of the world's shelf ends, you know, and uh, where, where, where can, who, who what belongs where, where, and Russia certainly, it is strategic in this area. It is opportunistic in many other places, but I see uh, it has started years before. They are building bases there, and they are certainly once, as uh, this ice is melting, they are certainly having uh, now an advantage. I know US is slowly and quietly trying, and other countries are sort of trying to see what they can do, but at the moment, uh, Russia is, <coughs> Controlling that, if they are the only ones having uh, icebreakers, uh, and uh, I think uh, the ambitions there are very high. From what I see, like uh, we are sort of not a play not players in that in that geographical area, but but this is something which uh, should be NATO's concern. Yeah, yeah but uh, but it absolutely is is a concern or wherever. I think you're right. Russia does have some advantages. The U.S. We're still trying to. Uh, it takes a long time to fund and then to build icebreakers, but they're doing that. Our Coast Guard uh, provides the icebreakers. But there's a NATO component to that, and then also, you know, the Canadians are very concerned about that. Russia, I don't remember how long ago it was, they actually claimed, you know, uh, the North Pole, on, you know, under the sea to say, you know, this will be uh, ours. There's some treaty concerns with that, so that'll all have to get uh, worked out. But it is it's another thing that we have to be concerned of. So again, we're over time, but we'll take two more questions, but please feel free to leave if you have to. Yes. We've heard a lot about external uh, threats, external challenges. But I have a question about more uh, internal ones. Uh, as you all know, 
Poland and wonder about the state. About the state. Uh, I have rather bad history with permanent uh, presence of uh, forces. Uh, and nowadays you can see uh, quite a lot of uh, public opinion resistance towards permanent basis of uh, American forces or other NATO forces. And are there any plans to overcome this? Because as we probably all know, each and every uh, accident, each and every incident uh, connected to foreign soldiers in Poland is highlighted by media. It's long out of proportion. So are there any plans to overcome this internal challenge? Uh, well, I would say that uh, in general, um, as far as this uh, US presence in Poland is concerned, uh, there, there, there was, uh, according to the uh, polls, and, uh, there, uh, what we observed was rather high uh, acceptance, social acceptance for um, the solutions, uh, the solution, especially as uh, something that is strengthening the, the security of Poland. Uh, that I, but, um, well, in fact, this uh, this presence uh, has been in place uh, since uh, 2015 and uh, extended in 2017 after um, the Warsaw Summit. Uh, so the, the, the current uh, increase in presence is in fact building up of what was already there. Uh, the major difference, because oh yeah, you, you were referring to historic uh, examples. Uh, uh, of course, uh, for example, if we take into consideration like uh, so Soviet forces uh, before 1993, even because they departed there, uh, the basis for their presence uh, in Poland was totally different because they came as, in fact, as occupation forces during the war, and they stayed. Uh, the legal framework was not really developed for their presence. They were just there. In fact, their bases were extraterritorial or were treated as such. And in the case of U.S. presence, the, the framework is totally different because uh, the U.S. forces uh, are present in Poland on the basis of, uh, of bilateral agreement. Uh, Invitation. Yeah, international, in fact, international agreement, uh, which was even ra ratified uh, uh, by um, by the president, ultimately, of course, the parliament and the president, according to the procedure uh, set in the constitution. Um, so, uh, a as you know, there is uh, uh, not as uh, a time frame set for this. But so, yes, so I would say that. Uh, Ah, and also the very important factor is that every uh, the facilities that are at the disposal of uh, U.S. Uh, troops are uh, also uh, are, uh, are given by, by Poland uh, on the basis or uh, of, uh, of bilateral agreement. There are conditions set out in this agreement, which say uh, under which uh, which say uh, how these uh, sites should be um, used by the U.S. In general, of course, Polish law applies there, uh, so the none of these bases or these uh, facilities are extraterritorial and uh, different aspects, uh, for example, concerning the even the legal responsibility of U.S. troops in the territory of Poland are regulated in this uh, in these agreements, also fiscal issues, I don't know, uh, that's, uh, customs, everything, so so the framework is totally different. You know, maybe if I can also, uh, it, it's interesting in our discussions with the region about, uh, okay, Estonia, Lithuania, Romania, what do you think of this? If there are permanent forces in Poland, what does that mean uh, in the region? What does it mean to you? Is it a problem? And if, if pretty much to an ally, uh, everybody on the region uh, supports this idea, uh, but there are some differences. For example, Lithuania would say, awesome, can you please bring permanent forces to Lithuania as well? If you go to the Czech Republic though, the Czech Republic will say, this is great, we understand that there's a necessity, uh, U.S. forces are closer to the front line, but uh, we do not want to host 
any permanent force. So there's this different uh, view of just uh, kind of getting to your point of forces from another country, where Poland has a, a, a you know holy uh, you know you know a few hundred year history uh, relationship with the United States. That there's this uh, innate uh, trust about the relationship and how you, the United States is going to behave. And we've basically shown that in, since we've deployed here, uh, how the U.S. treats uh, its ally in Poland, how the al uh, Poland treats uh, the United States, and so forth. And then rotationally, the same thing in the Baltics. And I would say the the last thing about this: um, uh, who's coming, when they're coming, how many are coming. Uh, it's, it's still to be worked out. Um, what there's a move within the Pentagon to sort of change the terminology of what we're calling rotational forces to a U.S. enduring uh, presence. So this word enduring is being used a lot. You don't hear anybody trotting out the word, let's see if it uses in here, permanent, but we're getting closer to what we think is uh, a very uh, um, dramatic impact on, on psyche that the United States is not going away. We keep increasing the funding for our regional ally support under something called the European Defense Initiative. Next year, it's over six billion. That's a significant amount. It's started under the Obama period, keeps growing under the uh, Trump administration. Um, so I'll leave it there. Okay, any any other final questions? One it's more. Just, it's not a question, but, but I, I can't resist saying this. One of the achievements of Mr. Putin, he doesn't know, is that he turned me back into political realist. I was drifting towards political idealism. And the political realist, um, Mr. Sopran has man mentioned whether we should allow uh, Russia to decide. It really doesn't matter. I don't allow them to decide what, what, they do, what Lithuania should be doing, but they will be trying to do this. To them, when Montenegro became a member, we say, yay, we, you know, we have one more member. To them, we lost. Yeah. I mean, they say, we lost Montenegro. Not unlike the United States saying, we lost China or we lost Vietnam. So this, this is going to continue. Yeah. But they will react whether or not we give them the right to do so, they will. Yeah. This is exactly this, what is called uh, political science zero-sum mentality, which I think we fundamentally disagree with. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a principal difference between the sort of, what, what I would say, modern European approach, where everybody can win, and the current Russian foreign policy approach, that if somebody sort of joins uh, NATO, or how they're lost. Yeah, and, and then also uh, on deterrence and presence, you know, this issue, again, hearing more from Western European allies, anything we do different, dramatic, or whatever is going to increase provocation uh, from the Russians. Clearly, you know, what happened in the Sea of Azov last year, um, there was no major NATO posture change. And yet the Russians uh, continue their aggression in the region against a, uh, a, an international sovereign nation uh, getting chewed up on the perimeter uh, like, uh, like we see in um, Ukraine. So our position on that, on this provocation, this security spiral we refer to, that, oh my God, we can't put one more troop in Poland because the Russians, that'll take them over the edge and they will invade and cut off the Sabalki corridor the next day. Uh, so we take the approach that we need to operationally and as allies come together, figure out what we think makes the most sense for deterrence and, uh, and assurance and be able to respond and take those actions and not uh, uh, sit there and, and um, just <coughs> worry all day long about what the Russians yeah. are because they're going to do what they're going to do. And they clearly have done that in Crimea and building up the bastion in Kaliningrad to a significant level. But, but that's a good point. I mean, you know, each the alliances understand that individual countries and as you said you know Putin that's what he wants to do so when they, when, when uh, NATO says uh, alliance solidarity is so important it is because so many countries have bilateral relations with uh, with Russia for economics or cultural ties or whatever it is and he'll chip them away um, but you know one, one thing that when you get into kind of the uh, intricacies of NATO uh, early on and it, it's still there it's not used anymore there's such a thing called the NATO Russia Council where they allowed NATO, uh, uh, Roberta said earlier about Russians even uh, participating in some of the early stuff, the Partnership for Peace and some of these exercises and things. Uh, but ne uh, Russia doesn't engage in that anymore at all. So it's like we know what their position is, uh, they know what the alliance position is and the majority of the countries are and there might be some countries that you know, look a little bit differently. But it's like we're never going to you know, sit down and agree with that. And as you said, that's just realism. That's the way it, 
that's the way it works. But yeah, the old NATO Russia Council, um, back when I was still in uniform going to NATO meetings, they would gavel it in and then gavel it out and it was done. <coughs> so the, the Russian ambassador would walk in, that was it, nothing, nothing would be discussed. And so eventually I think they pulled out of that or they, they agreed to discontinue it or something. Yeah, try, uh, let me just add, try to imagine this partnership for peace where, where Russia, so partnership for peace is a way for any uh, nation in Europe uh, that wants to do things with NATO, exercise and so forth, but not join and get full membership benefits, uh, they can do that. And Russia was actually allowed to come in uh, and theoretically one day if Russia you know, totally changed its stripes, they might join. actually join NATO because it was a stepping stone to go. But anyway, um, can you imagine 2005, I'm taking like 10 uh, Polish officers to Grafenfeer, Germany, which is the United States giant training area, and we're driving over to uh, observe um, some, actually some American training. And on the way to the American training, uh, we stop because there's actually a checkpoint on the road, a training checkpoint, and it's a, a bunch of Americans uh, showing Russians how to run a security checkpoint in a foreign kind of peacekeeping uh, mission. Here, here the Poles get out and they're talking to the Russians, 2005, in Russian, and they're actually, I mean, they're not, you know, going fist to cup, they're actually getting along. So that was those, those days, and things have dramatically changed, but that was the direction NATO was trying to go, is what, what I was yeah. trying to give an example. Yeah. Okay, so again, we are over time. If, if uh, anyone wants to stay and uh, talk, or maybe we should take it downstairs. So again, thank you for coming, and uh, thank you to our participants. Bye -bye.